how strong are offer. So suddenly I'm thinking, I sure need to find a new house to live in. Anyway, after a day's full breath, I met up with the estate agent and followed her around the whole Pyrenees and the Shares for about 60 miles looking at various houses. Could we have a change of screen, please, Alan? There we go. So, just been asked um, where I live. So we're looking now at the Spanish border down here. We've got the Pyrenees running through there. The whole Pyrenees is this area, and the Shares is this area, and I live in the Shares. So we have Toulouse sort of up here and Bordeaux up there, just to give you an idea. Bordeaux's actually there. So it's a heck of a long drive from Calais. But when you descend, you just keep going. Um, so I say, I followed around a lot of the Hope Pyrenees and the Gers, Um and they came, the houses, well, they came in all shapes and sizes, some great for our family, and others, I think, rather challenging, or well, I think the estate agent spiel is in need of some modernisation. <laughs> um, the French have a lot of old farmhouses, and they're all built on the same shape. You have the sort of main house, and then you have the barns that come down there. Lots of people have converted the barns into sheets. Others, the barns are gently falling down. <laughs> also trying to explain that I actually wanted a flat garden. <laughs> so, so you should have a bungalow. Your legs aren't very good. No, I don't want a bungalow. I want a house. But come and look at a bungalow, Sue. So. Garden was one in six. <laughs> so tough. <laughs> So and then the second to last house was the one on the internet, and it was love at first, or should I say, second sight. This house is on the edge of a medieval village called Tiak. Change the screen, please. So that is my house. Um, that bit there, that's my own main neighbour over the road. I have a neighbour over there. I've never yet seen him. He's a total French recluse, which suits me quite. Um, I'm not sure what he thought about the noise when my family turned up, but never mind. <laughs> Can we take on to the next one, please, Anne? So this is the village that I live on the edge of. Um, it's medieval, extremely old, and I will come back to a little bit of the history later on. But these buildings are absolutely amazing. They're mainly bottle and door, and there's no cars allowed through this part at all. And the church is, is also very old, and you can see there's a fortification tower just at the end of the, the main street there. I visited twice and then made an offer, had a few days holiday and returned to England to pack up the house in Hassocks. Started negotiations to sell part of my business and say goodbye to friends and family. Movie day was set for late September. On the 14th of September, the removal man's duty turned up to put most of the concerts of my house in storage. Screen please. A little more of Tiak with one of its other fortification towers. Please go back to Roman times. And so if we go on. So these guys turned up, and the next one, please. We're just a small man. <laughs> <laughs> now, what happens? They load all your stuff into these wooden containers within a van of two vans, and then it goes into store, but once it's moved to France, it comes out of the containers so that they can actually almost double the amount they get into one van. Oh. It, it's really clever. All they do is foreign transit. So there we are. Um, most of the contents of my house go toddling off on the 14th of September. I was left with a bed, kitchen table, two chairs, a sofa, a few cooking bits, a couple of plates, the contents of my office, a few autumn clothes, and oh, Harry the dog. <laughs> but hey, no problem, the house there was going through no pictures, and I was still on my gear again in a month. Well, as they say, best laid plants of mice and men. Now, when you buy in France, you have to pay a substantial deposit, and then you have a cooling off period. It's about 10 days, 10, 14 days. And once that passes, the deposit is non refundable. Also, if you withdraw, they can double that and fine you. So my deposit was sent to the notaire, he's the equivalent of your solicitor, but acts for both sides, so much more straightforward. And all parties in the chain in England proceeding well. Then 12 hours after my deadline to withdraw in France passed, I had a phone call from the agent in England to tell me that my buyer's, buyers 
have been advised to pull out by their solicitors because Barrett Homes have sold out their land with their freehold houses sitting on it to a company which holds a lease. The government was supposed to have sorted this out, but again, COVID raised its nasty head and the mortgage companies don't like this at all. Now, what was I to do? I had a month to raise the money to complete the purchase of the house in France. My house looks house was put back on the market the next day, and within a few days, I had another offer on it. Good, I thought, I might just be able to hold up the French side for long enough. Advantage being, they have to do a FOSS survey, which is the sewage system, and the water board would be very slow. And I'd say, oh, no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. <laughs> 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 Um, however, solicitors are so good at dragging their feet and coming up with the most ridiculous questions requiring research for years back, and in my case, even before Jeff and I had bought the house 34 years prior. So Sue was not going to give up. A bridging loan, I thought. Well, what fun, or should I say, what a nightmare. That turned out to be. You try paying off your mortgage. Oh no, you can't do that. But imagine you have to do that for a solicitor. No, I've only got a few pounds of mortgage left, we need even bought a car. But no, you have to do that for a sister. But because the money was in my business account, no, we can't use that. And it went back and forth and back and forth for my feet. Now what do you do? Because you can't raise a bridging loan on a house that's already got a mortgage on it. Anyway, um, this nightmare con continued, but I met a fantastic solicitor through the loan company in the Midlands. And he was just amazing, absolutely amazing. So the loan was finally secured and the money was sent to France. Even that was a hiccup because the loan company pays the French letter directly. You don't get anywhere near the money. The agent in France phoned me up on that last day and she said, um, so we're an awful lot of money short. Pardon, we can't be, it's all been worked out to the last penny. No, we're about 20,000 euros short. And I said, that is a lot of money. So often I get to my sister, I said, what's going on? Oh, but we're, the loan company will be paying the notaire by a Baptist bone. I said, oh, no, they won't. They will be paying it by a money agent because we use money agents between, quite legal money agents between England and France who buy at the best possible rate. So this is his arguing again, time running out again. They finally capitulated, and it would have cost me 20 grand if I hadn't stuck out on that one. <laughs> so you learn as you go along. Stella knows how fraught I was by then. <laughs> yes, uh, it's a wonder you've got any hair left, so well, yeah. <laughs> So it was by now mid-October. I decided to fly out for a week to sort out the utilities. I'm just for a few days in my now new home. Uh -huh. I arrived on the Sunday late evening. I had a phone call from my son James on the Tuesday evening. You need to come home, Mum, tomorrow morning, otherwise you'll be locked down in France. The last seat on the plane cost 500 euros. So back I was in England, with winter approaching, clothes in store, two houses, I actually call me near three houses, and no sign of the cell completing. Luckily for me, Stella provided cooking pots and jumpers. There's a limit to how long you can survive on camping rations. <laughs> when October became November, December was knocking on the door, and 31st of December was the deadline for the Brexit deal and the removal firm. They well knew that once Brexit deal was done, that they would have massive problems moving um, anything between the two countries. And in fact, they now have to do a full inventory of what is in those loans. So I thought, to hell with it. Let the solicitors and agents need them earn some money. Let's face it, they're charging that. And so I set 7th of December as my deadline to leave. I packed the car with my computers, a few clothes, Harry and I. Everything else had to go into the removal van. The lads arrived to load up the remaining household bits and all the office filing cabinets and equipment. And as you'll probably remember, my office was in the garden. Well, the weather just could not have been worse. They were soaked, absolutely soaked by the end of the morning, but they still worked on without grumble. This is a lot for them. I went to my son for a couple of days, and then with Harry, we set off at 6 a.m. for the tunnel. And I managed to drive to North Bordeaux that first day through the most appalling weather. Move on with your slide, please. So that was what it was like most of the way down. 
Um, if it wasn't like that, it was raining so hard you couldn't actually see the road surface. Harry, however, was sedated, so he happily slept most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I could push on and drive into the night, but no, there was a curfew in France, so I had to find a hotel. Fortunately, I happened to have dogs stay, so he and I shared a room in an Ibis. Breakfast was left outside the door and contact with humans kept to an absolute minimum. The rain continued but I plodded on and made it to Marseille by lunchtime. Fortunately, I bought the letting part of the property fully furnished so I had a lovely bed to sleep in that night. Can we click on and see the pictures? So, ah. this was the sort of wet. And the next one please, Alan. Now this is not a lily pond, this is actually my drive. <sighs> Um, so I think you might know, be news by the way. <laughs> um, my furniture and clothes finally arrived on the 27th of December. I only unpacked some of the boxes two months ago because the main house needed some building work done and I stayed in the old farmhouse. The removal guys were held up because of the okay before Christmas and I had to turn back from Portsmouth the week before. Fortunately, their mates at the port said it was bad and they were able to turn around and go home for Christmas. A lot of those poor lads were stuck at the ports all over Christmas. Um, and so they actually came down on what was the English Boxing Day and they parked on my drive, stayed overnight. Uh, they're really just brilliant guys. The house in Hassocks finally sold on the 14th of December. Alleluia. So here I am in my new house with the weather so cold and wet, it's good old variety. Next, please. It even snowed. <laughs> Um, now, that's been unheard of for about the last 15 years, so I got blamed for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the old farmhouse has central heating, and I've been assured that the boiler had been serviced before I viewed the house in July, and it would be fine. Well, I should have known, within two weeks, a new boiler has been installed, as the old one was condemned. Fortunately, I have a substantial log burner, which kept the worst of the cold at bay, and click. Oh, and yeah, Harry. There he is. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, that's Harry, isn't it? Yeah. This is um, between 100 and 200 years old, part of this surround with the beams. Uh, obviously, that's not. This was the original farmhouse, the original farm. Mm -hmm. It was a French company that replaced the boiler, and I used, also used a French electrician. Other than that, nearly all the other trades have been British with a leaning towards Yorkshireman. Even the chap who delivered the logs was a surly Yorkshireman. <laughs> Driving the drive and said, Can I come in there? No, I tip the back of the lorry up all over the drive and drove off again. <laughs> <laughs> I'd let the builder born in Huddersfield say to my mum in October, and we had agreed a schedule of works. He has proved to be such a help, introduced me to other people, and even taken me to the doctors. This was by way the poshest surgery I have ever seen. It just phenomenal. It puts all the surgeries in England to absolute shame. Right, shall we see what the next? Okay, right, that's why I'm going to stay there. Right, back to life in the chair for lack of it. The curfew was brought down to 6 a.m. to 6. From, yes, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. for weeks, <coughs> and no sign of vaccine being available. Luckily, the builder was allowed to work, so we started in the bathrooms in the main house. Both showers had been built under the eaves, and I did not fancy ducking every time I used them. Any taller visitor, including my brother, would probably have ended up with severe headaches. Also, the staircase was too steep for needed replacing. Now, this is the rake on the staircase, and they've taken out the bottom step. <laughs> you notice the amount of wine they have available underneath. This was taken at the previous owners to live in there. <laughs> so, that's fine. Um, now, I live about an hour and a half in the Spanish border, and I think the term manana has crept into that. <laughs> Four months later, the bespoke staircase finally arrived. Click on, please. Which, to be fair, is beautiful. And it was made by a local French artisan, so worth the wait. And this is just one sort of piece of wood. These are turned out of the same wood. And that handrail is one continuous curved piece of wood. Lovely. And I gather the chap's mate actually made it, but the chap fitting the staircase is about that hard. <laughs> and it's just amazing to watch him because every single step he put together as he as it, and he sort of went up yeah. with it. Built, built it as he went up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so 
a long way, but that is what some of the local French artisans can do. So next item, please. I also found a good use for the old staircase. Wow. <laughs> Now the weather in March was really warm, so I managed to treat the garage with shallow wood preservatives. Then winter returned with heavy frosts. The vineyards had to light fires in the valleys and the growing growing areas to translate the vines. And also the farmers were very late planting the maize, sunflower, and soybeans, which are the staple crops in the area. Could you click? These are the sunflowers. I'm beginning to fade. They're fantastic when they're in full flower, and there are millions and millions of them. And they wait till they're completely black and dead before they bring the harvesters through. Mm. And, and they're, they're just so valuable. So mm. valuable. Now, last summer, the water sprays were on every day, but this summer they've been, hardly been used. There are a number of reservoirs to help the supply of water needed in the normal summer. If you can move on, please. So you can see this is fairly dry this summer. Last summer, that would have been absolutely baked. So if we can click on, this was what it looked like last summer out in the fields. Um, and they were struggling all day, every day to try and get enough water onto the fields. So we go on. And this is one of the reservoirs that's been built in the region to supply the farms with water. And it's absolutely huge and you can walk around the edge of it. So another click piece. And that's the view of the reservoir driving down the road near where I live. You twitched, didn't you? <laughs> Turn on the light came on. <laughs> um, just a magical looking place, but it's there for a good purpose. So um, the local farmer, however, managed to cut two crops from his grass field by my house. Now Harry really does not approve of the machinery. I tried to explain to him that it should not dark as fine as live there. And the men as the field are owned by the local mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Now each village and town has their own mayor, and usually the best kept building is the Marie, which is a town hall to and this is the one in Tiak. And this is the general standard of the town halls. Um, the mayor can decide whether or not you can be in business in the village. Fortunately, the Brits are fairly popular because we bring much of the wealth into the rural areas, although this is now changing with so many French people have decided to move away from the cities to avoid the COVID. Anyway, back to day to day life, the restrictions got worse. We were limited to a 10 kilometre journey to the shop, which is the exact distance to the supermarket in Marciac. We had to carry paperwork in our car to, um, can't read my numbers yet, to show why we were making the trip. The only exceptions were medical and government appointments. Now, when I arrived in France, my top priority was to register on the French health system and apply for residency. Luckily for me, the paperwork for the health service came through very quickly. It was on Easter Sunday. I ended up in a French ambulance on my way to A&E. The crew spoke hardly any English, and I felt too unwell to cope with much French. Now, the view in England is carrying ideas against civil liberty. In France, you need ID all the time. So my passport and health card were always with me. A good job, because the guy in the ambulance needed all that info. Most of the doctors, however, speak English as part of their training. And by 11 p.m., they decided to have to go home and would be referred to a specialist. So I asked, well, how do I get home? Oh, we're not sure. Jerry and Mike were about 26 miles away from where I live. Fortunately for me, my lovely English neighbours came to rescue me. I've since seen two heart specialists and had a raft of tests in Toulouse at the top heart unit in Europe. No waiting months. The lesson from all this is now I have more help with houses and garden rather than trying to do it for myself. <coughs> and I also feel less than I've done in years. So back to the residency, I was summoned to Osh to the government offices for interview. We click and see if we've got, oh, just a bit of fun on the way. This is the guy who's done all the building work for me. That's his French apprentice and this is the lorry driver. But three men have to do a lot of discussing as to how to offload these slabs onto my drive. <laughs> <laughs> and it was probably near lunchtime and 12 o'clock, that's lunchtime. Yeah. And if they're meeting their mates, two o'clock, they're back. <laughs> so they arrive at nine, go off at 12, they might start back at one or two and they go home at four. <laughs> That's it. You won't get another thing out of them until the next day. But you just, what you learn is don't go on a day rate, go on a fixed contract price. <laughs> so, um, so I was, if you can click on, please. 
So just a little bit of, um, they, these were the slabs that they were delivering. Because when I moved in, it's just mud from there to there, which is a pretty stupid idea. Hmm. That's the letting sheet, and that's my house. Um, so carrying on, so back to the residency, that's fine, you stop there for a minute. I was summoned to Osh to the government offices for interview. Osh is equivalent to the county town of the shares with a cathedral on the hill. There is also a river in the valley and no doubt it was well fortified when it first built. So, Thank you. just a little message from Zoom to say, running out of time. We've moved, removed the 40 minute time limit on your group meeting. So uh, carry on. Thank you. So Osh is a very old town. The Romans noticed this as a settlement during the conquest in the 50s BC. An antiquarian tribe lived there known to the Romans as Oski. The Romans renamed the town Augusta, which evolved into the French Osh. The town became the seat of the Catholic Archdiocese until the French Revolution. It is known for its Renaissance Cathedral, which is this building up here, and its prison, 14th century prison. The government offices are at the bottom of the hill. So if we click on to the next one, please. So this is the um, cathedral, which sadly I couldn't go into them so shut. And you've got very steep roads down each side. Then you go down there, past the gendarmes place, and um, you've got, you then go through an old arch, and they let you in a little door, then you walk across a courtyard, and they finally you get into where you're going to be interviewed. You've not much chance of getting out at that point. <laughs> Once they've got you there, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the appointment was for 9.30 a.m., and I was called to the desk absolutely on the dot. Fingerprints are taken, confirmation I had a permanent address in France and a passport type Photoshop supplied. Paperwork has to be emailed to them beforehand so that they can check you out. I was approved, amazingly. <laughs> uh, my residency card sent to the post. This also goes everywhere with me. Thank goodness, because I needed this at the docks to get out of the funds. It's interesting, the French are very keen on civil liberty, but they never worry about the ID side. <laughs> Lockdown continued, but the vaccination programme picked up and I was vaccinated in May. Let me see what next picture we might have. Right, that's fine. Stop it. Since the 1st of August, you cannot go to restaurants without proof of vaccination and masks are mandatory in all buildings. There's a massive shopping centre in Tarb and there are guards on the doors checking the vaccine proof apps and the masks and they will not let you in unless you have that. By June, the restaurants could serve outside, so I began to meet some more people and now I'm quite a group of friends. I've joined the English Theatre Company, no acting. <laughs> <laughs> However, I offered to help with catering, I think I'll be running it by next year. <laughs> and I've also met a group who help with language learning and organise days out. The members of various nationalities, which is, is actually really nice. Um, so, moving on from there, sorry, this a bit. The next pictures. This one is of Marciac and the Central Square, and it's used for markets every Wednesday. It's famous for its jazz festivals, and the town dates back to the late 12th century, but is now famous in the present day. It's characteristic of the Bastides in the area, with the square and the town hall being the main feature. Now, this is the town hall here, and you will see if you look. There are claxtons on the top of the town hall. Okay. Yeah. There's an old bell, but there's the new claxton. Now, I was in the square at 12 o'clock one day. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> the claxton goes off. You can't ignore it. <laughs> Tools down, boys. Down to the cafe for lunch. <laughs> and that's it. And you can hear the church bells going at 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock is that's your lot. So coming back to the jazz festival, it was, it was founded in 1978. The jazz in Marciac has become over the years one of the unmissable events of the national and European jazz scene. Since 1991, a guy called Winton Marcellus, yes. which you might have heard of, is a fantastic yeah. jazz player, has been sponsoring the festival, which now hosts 180,000 festival goers, including 50,000 paying spectators. 
sadly, of course, COVID last year, the whole thing was cancelled and this year it's only run at a very moderate level, which is very hard on all the little shops and restaurants that rely on it. But they did set up a big bandstand here and they had racks seating all the way back down. And then you could sit in the restaurants around the edge. There are, it's a square, so there's four entries. There were four Jones arms on each entry point. If you did not have a mask and you did not have a pass, you weren't going in there. And it's, that is how they're trying to protect the locals from the fact of all the people coming in. It originally focused on traditional jazz, but in recent years, it's become a place for blues, rhythm and blues, soul music, or Latin jazz. It's fantastic when you have some, there was a busker playing. It's just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But um, I say, hopefully by next year, it will be a bigger festival, because the, from the point of view, my point of view and others, the renting potential is absolutely fantastic in that way. Now, if we move on from Marciac, this is the sort of pictures that are on the walls, very old, very well cared for. And the next one is one of the old streets of Marciac. If we can get to the next one, which just gives you an idea of the buildings and the shutters. And you begin to learn when it's very hot, you shut the shutters, and open the windows behind you, stop the sun pouring in all the time when it's very hot. Right, now I think next one we probably move on, yes, to Basus, a place called Basus, right up in the hills. And it's a medieval town overlooking the charming little fortified village of Bastide or Basus. It's 14th century, a relic of the old castle of the Archbishop of Osh. And it's a remarkable example of military architecture. It's 43 metres high and follows a quadrangle plan and was completed in 1371. Now, when I was there a few weeks ago with my family, my daughter in law and I decided that it was probably far more ladylike to stay at the bottom. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's no lift, there's five floors. And we thought David would probably have a cardiac arrest by the time he got to the top, but he and Ethan got there. And there is no protection out here. There's no health and safety in France, forget it. And they both chickened out at that point. It's almost like spine. Yeah. yeah. Um, it has a magnificent view of the Gascoigne landscape and the Pyrenees mountain range. And there's a museum about the history of the Gascoigne villages as well as exhibitions of paintings and watercolours. And then if you click on, this is the middle of the village and you've got the old bottle and door houses. And the restaurant, when they're overflowing, just put the tables up and the cars kind of potter through and you kind of hope the car won't let you hit the table, but they don't. <laughs> Very laid back, and the bikers like it there, so you end up with some rows and rows of motorbikes. It's just, I think that's how they live. So, if we tick on, please, now we're back to Tiak. So, the, the population is about 300, so it really is tiny, and it's, it's in the department of the Gers, and it's formally fortified. It takes it's some 40 kilometers from Osh and about 10 kilometres to 6 miles off from Marciac. And its locality has been there since the Middle Ages. It's surrounded by the valley of the Bue, or the Buse as we call it, that's the river. And it's from the Gaelo-Roman Tiliacus, and was built at different times. One can discover vestiges of the Roman antiquity of even the 10th and 11th century. So we've got this fantastic old church, and this has just been re-roofed. And there's been some ramblings locally. Well, the roofing should have been done in the old style, but my thoughts are no. The roofing's been done now. Mm. And three or four, five hundred years time, if that's still standing, they can look back at the history of when the first part was built and then the roof redone. The workmanship on the roof is phenomenal. So you've then got one of the towers here. And then the old high street, which you've already seen, comes back this way. So um, it's um, it's a fascinating, fascinating little village, and it's one of the few fortified um, villages in the valley. 
with an attempt to keep the Romans out, which of course didn't work. Because <laughs> I live just off the Roman road and it's literally bullet straight for time. <laughs> they didn't worry about turning calls. <laughs> um, you can see a little bit of the moat. A lot of it obviously is gone, but there's just bits and pieces still left. One of the locals is complaining it's been underdeveloped now because they've built three new bungalows. <laughs> But such is the um, view of the area, you know, you don't go forward, you go backwards. So if we can click on, please. So this is the three-sided tower, which is very, very unusual. Again, with a bell on top. <coughs> and you just get an idea of just how old these buildings are. One's just been sold. I mean, they look tatty outside. They're often beautifully kept inside, but they have to maintain their old look. So if we go on, and that's looking through that tower down towards the other tower. There's a nice restaurant here, and you can sort of sit out here or just behind there. And it's fine if you like duck, probably not much could you be done. <laughs> <laughs> no cars are allowed through there, and there's some very specific reasons. Okay, and again, you can see the fantastic work in all these panels. A lot of work went into them. Okay, thank you. Ooh, now, nice. that's nice. there's a, a very small town called Plaisance, which is about probably 20 miles from where I live. And I was invited to go to the Bark Recycle. So off I went, not really knowing anything about the town or the cathedral or the church. <coughs> the church is a massive out there. Until I walked in. When I walked in, see these doors, they were shut. All the way up. So all you could see was like just the doors. And I was told it was a bark recital, and until he played the first note, and the whole thing opened up. And there's about 150 pipes, and it was absolutely fantastic. But it currently is a very famous organist, and virtually comes to it for the pleasure of it. And it's one of the three best organs in the whole front. And hearing the Takata and Fugue played on that was something you would never forget. So that was a great evening. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the first evenings that I've had out in I don't know how long. Years probably. So moving on from Pleasant, we have D'Artagnan. Uh -huh. The real D'Artagnan, not the storybook. And this is Lupiac. Now Lupiac is a little 45 village up on the hills about 20, 30 miles from where I live. And they were given um, funding about three years ago to completely renovate the centre and build this fantastic bronze statue. And in fact, D'Artagnan um, was in fact a guard of the king at the time. So if we click through, and he was in the service of the king of France. These are very, very old buildings. Again, you can see this is owned by the government, and this is one continuous building. The brickwork is absolutely superb in it. Um, now, my view was it would have looked better if they cobbled all this. My daughter in law was very quick to tell me, thank goodness they hadn't, because she tries to clean a wheelchair over the cobbles. <laughs> so, obviously, there was some practical thoughts. So, if you click on, it's amazing what riffs actually find in the middle of these pages. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my grand dog even managed to travel down in the family. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the workmanship in this is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Get forward and another view of it. So, and then um, we had a day trip to the Pyrenees. And if you click through here, this is um, just in one of the roads in the centre of the Pyrenees. And although there's these marks, the roads are in fantastic condition. I just have forgotten how bad English roads were. Even up high, they're filled, they're repaired. If there's even a little dent in the road, there's a sign to say there's a problem. <laughs> you would need signs. Almost constantly. Um, great French fun. I was standing taking these photos, and there was some French guys here, and they were once he said, Can't take photos of us now. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we look a bit further. Now, very Swiss looking, 
with the very steep roofs, as you can see here and here. Um, the very little snow at the moment, as with all these places, but of course in the winter, it is just heavy snow. There's a lot of skiing. Um, and so, um, yeah, our friends who were out there skiing in the winter sent me some pictures, incredible sight. But pretty little villages, really pretty little villages. We click forward. One of the very high peaks. Yeah. Mm, keep going. Oh, and then you drive up to the top of the cold to spin, which is where the um, to the front, you know, the cyclists go. Yeah. Well, the cattle live up there. <laughs> and like you humans, you know, you sit bikes and city cars. We're quite happy up here. Um, very peaceful looking cattle until you argue with them. So <laughs> kick on. And then there's this gorgeous little village called Ario, and it's on the D99, which is the road to Spain from Tal. It's the former route nationale, and it is absolutely exquisite. And it's at the foot of the Col d'Espagne, which is where the Tour de France, Tour de France goes. And it's just such a picturesque place. And when I first went there last summer, I walked through to this. This cathedral, and you could only go into just a tiny part of it. And I'll admit, I think, well, this uh, camp for Jeff there, I think he would have liked it there very much. So if you click forward, this is just some other views. Again, exquisite workmanship in these very old buildings, and they're very well kept. And one more. So we're back mm -hmm. to look at the Pyrenees from the bottom of my garden now. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And this is a winter view, which they show up in the summer, you barely know they were there. It's as if someone's rubbed them out because you get, <laughs> I don't know quite why, but it's still the atmosphere. When it's winter, of course, you've got the high snow level. Mm -hmm. um, so if you pick forward. Oh, what's nice. Um, that was just one night. I caught one of the fantastic skies in the area. Keep going, please. And this is an aerial view of, this is my, my lot here. And what's very interesting is yeah. to see this heart shape. Mm -hmm. And I was showing my brother, who did a lot of archaeology this time, he said, well, you can find out some more history. Now, having looked to find that Tiak goes back to Roman times, he said it's highly likely there's something under there. But I'm not going to comment because I don't want them to dig the back <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's just rather interesting because you never see that, would you? No, 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 no. That's fine. You never know. This is the field that Squire Davis objects to the mully. Oh. <laughs> um, but that's been grass this year, which is lucky for me because if it had been maize, then it would have been up very high and very dusty. So if we go on. Now, when I went there, James said, Do you miss the downs, Mum? Not a lot. This is up the road. <laughs> oh, sorry, it looks like it's up on the hill. It is up on the hill. It's quite a high hill, and that's just a view that you can just see for miles and miles. So if you go forward. Now, this is um, the watering systems. You see this great big thing that goes right out there. And that is robotic, and it's got a flashing light. It was quite spooky at night. <laughs> 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 But this is a winter of early shot, and that's the highest point in the Pyrenees, which I can actually see in the winter where the trees are down in my back garden. So pretty, pretty good view. Pretty good view. Mm. So we click on. Again, this was the difference last summer <clears throat> to this. Mm. And I think we've had very little hot weather, same as you. So, um, but again, this is part of just the hillsides and countrysides around me. So if we go forward, and again the same with that. And this is my lane. So you can just see a little bit of the farmhouse there. And that's my neighbour over there. Very busy lane, as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and next one. And so I've just had these mice put down the swimming pool, which is quite fun. That's the, that's the garage with the pool house. And then there's a chalet here, which has been converted totally. So wheelchair access has worked very well. And if we stop there, please, um, for a minute. So now, when I told my sons that I was moving to France, they said, Mummy, you need a French lover. 
<laughs> How about a nice, handsome black French lover? My sons are allowed to say this because my eldest son is married to an Indian, so we're allowed sort of mixed race comments in our family. Um, be good to keep me company. Well, David came to stay in August and he found me a lover. He brought the lover home with him. The language skills aren't great though. We're coming to communication skills at the moment, but the couples are absolutely wonderful. So click, click on please. So oh. meet Jeffers. <laughs> he was found wandering in the fields, howling, absolutely starving. Um, we took him to the mayor, well, mayor's mum, and she said, Take him to the vets, we took him to the vets, and he wasn't chipped. And so she said, We keep him, so we named him after Jeff. Oh. <laughs> So that is my little black French lover. Oh. <laughs> and that's my story so far. Thank you very much. And if you click one more, just one more. Uh, uh, no. Uh, so that's, I can't see it. I suppose we should go and catch some mice. Au revoir. De moi et maman de Harry. Thank you. 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 Any questions from those those who are listening from Zoom? And I'll pick them up on the direct messages. And I've got a message screen up here, so I'm just doing things. Mm. All this lot came from the local tourist board. You're welcome to look at it. I can leave it. It's all, well, all about the area. And it is, I don't regret one day. Not one day. Mm. However, what I didn't mention, when I went to view the house, I was left to wander around and I walked around to the back garden and I stood there and I said, You're bloody here, aren't you, David? <laughs> now, Tony, do you remember when I went away working many years ago and an edifice grew in my back garden? Indeed. Mm. Indeed. It was exactly like it. Yes. Mm. Oh, well, I, can't... I can't imagine Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was supposed to be in the, in the sort of tucked away and then yeah. in the middle of the whole time. I've got another one. <laughs> um, just as a aside quickly, uh, Bernie M0XYF says, just to say hi to Sue and many thanks for an excellent pre presentation. Thank you. Hi, Bernie. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Uh, nobody else at the moment. But, uh, oh, yes, you, you've, you've ended up with another one of those dishes, have you? Uh, yes, and <laughs> I've, just, I've just asked the builder to please build a casino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're knowing how big that one was. It's exactly the same. It's absolutely, it's true. I, identical. Identical. Yeah. But you have to have it there, otherwise I get no Same goes from Merv as well. Thanks for the presentation. Well, it's been a very interesting um, build around year, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but we if they letting not happen, but if I've got a lot of the projects done, which is perhaps a good thing. So mm -hmm. hopefully from January, I'm open for holiday business, which is the idea. Mm -hmm. right. Me, the dog and the cat. And mm -hmm. this little fella has already cottoned on to where the food's kept. <laughs> Harry will sit by the drawer, and now he sits with his paws up on the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> I never think it's like having the Tom and Jerry show. <laughs> Yes, I think they will um, see. I'm not sure who's going to win this one now, but you know. <laughs> uh, Harry settled in incredibly well as well, which is going to be quite a big thing. Sadly, he's just had major surgery. Um, he had, we apparently had tumours. The blessing is we got there in time. Good. So he's a very baldric Harry at the moment, feeling very sorry for himself, but the lab have now confirmed that we've beaten it and it hasn't gone to the rest of his body. Good. Because I would hate to have lost him, because yeah. he's definitely my mate down there. Yeah. And he can't escape anymore. No, um, the builder chap thanks to the whole garden before I arrived. Mm -hmm. It's great. For your information, Harry used to come to the radio club with me. Yes. <laughs> Yes. He's very firm. Yeah. And he used to mold. Oh, well, yes. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but you knew that. I knew that. Yeah, double, double inside. <laughs> yes. So he needs to play. He was a healthy dog. He was yes. a healthy yes. dog. And mm. actually, um, what is amazing is he 
has got that in him. Very protective, very, very sensitive to how you feel. Brilliant with me. Yeah. He knew when I had a fit. He knew, didn't he? He knew you were going to have a fit. It was really interesting. Spooky. But when the family was staying, because they were in the chalet, and I wake up in the morning, no dog, no cat. And then I get a phone call. Mother, would you like breakfast? And I go down there, and it's his dog, my dog, my cat. <laughs> <laughs> that was a chaos tell me. It was like a busy cat right. breakfast in the middle of it all. But it was nice to see them. It was absolutely wonderful to see them. That's, I think, for all of us, has been the hardest part, hasn't it, for the last couple of years. Mm. All right. Right. OK. If there's no more any quick questions, I'm going to close the Zoom meeting. Yeah, I've got a quick one here. Um, how's your French coming along? Can you deal with French? Um, a lot yeah. better than ten months ago. Um, it's um, I'm now joined a, a group called the Marseillais, which is a mixture of nationalities, mm -hmm. and they're going to start the um, French English lessons again because a lot of the French or the Belgians want to learn English. Yeah. And we want to talk about French, so it's a lovely way to meet and exchange. Mm. It's much easier to learn like that. But certainly, driving up to the port, I understood a lot more of the signs than I did even mm. nine or ten months ago. The brain works in mysterious ways when it has to do so. Yeah, I mean, bearing in mind I've not done French since I was fifteen, mm. um, but it does. You begin automatically to walk in the shop and say bonjour, and you find that it's. You're suddenly not thinking about it, you know what I mean? I just had to remember when I got into Portsmouth. Yeah, the people down there aren't, uh, aren't uh, uh, Parisian, you know, no. they're, 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 they are different. They are quite Spanish based. Um, I find them easy to listen to. A lot of people say they find that dif difficult, but I don't actually. Um, if you say long, on, long, on, gently, slowly, then they will slow down. But if you even try half a sentence, it's great. Mm. And the lady in the village shop doesn't speak any English, but we get by. <laughs> Ernie is just asking, he said, he's asking, does Sue have any plans to get an antenna up? Yes. There's 10 people, not including Sue, in the, in the room there, Bernie. That's right, just ask another supplementary on that. When, when the aerial rigging department can get down there, get down there yes, but it's been impossible, yeah. as you can imagine. Yes, yeah, so she said she'll be having some English, English aerial riggers going down, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have one or two trees. Mm. Um, Jeff would have absolutely loved it. He had a passion for trees. He could have been in this element because between me and my French neighbour, they are so big. Mm -hmm. But it, they're just out of the way. The kitten found out rather quickly. He could run up them, but it was only <laughs> <it got into, laughs> running back down. <laughs> but to be honest, even the tree in the front drive, you could put an aerial out of the bedroom window into it. Yeah. You know? um, I think Merv is about to give it, ask a question. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, uh, Go on, we can hear you, Merv. Oh, you can. All oh, right. Okay. All oh, right. Yeah. Well, just saying thanks, Sue, for coming over. Um, unfortunately, we missed the first bit of your your talk, but uh, hopefully, uh, the recording um, when we get to listen to it again, it will be uh, um, uh, uh, good to hear. I just just wondered. Um, Sandra was sitting here earlier. She got a bit a bit frustrated because I, we're 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 down in Ringwood at the moment, and uh, I, I had you on the on the television earlier, and uh, we had an echo, and we're a bit of moving around. Um, we, you, I know you're reading from your script. Is there any chance of uh, publishing your script so we can <laughs> of your talk? Just, just Probably, if I retype it into some sort of yeah, I don't see why not. When I get back to France, I will probably read email it. Mm. Yeah, it'd be wonderful to read through your story, Sue, really, because um, obviously us on the Zoom, uh, it was a little bit difficult in some instances to, to keep up with it all. Yeah, yes, no problem. It was, it was a very fraught few months. <laughs> yeah, imagine, yeah, but it was quite a fascinating story, certainly. 
Well, it was, um, I think you call it the mad woman on her own, really. <laughs> Well, that sounds brilliant to me. <laughs> yes, and apologies for the late start, but somebody helped me connect things up and they plugged the uh, VGA lead into the wrong socket on the back of the projector and I didn't realise it had two, two VGA sockets, so we couldn't get it connected. I was getting a little frustrated. Is the radio society not a multimedia one, maybe? Well, yeah, this is it. Uh, where is the radio club? Come on, if things went smoothly, things have gone wrong. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I will leave all the posters and bits and pieces. Yeah, I'm a box friend in the Institute of Friendly Society, and some of them have their own conference in France, and they'll be interested in seeing me in the video. There's a lot of people who haven't been near their home. French properties for over a year. They're slowly coming yes. back. It's been very hard for a lot of people. I have a, an English friend who lives um, east of Beirut. Yeah. Uh, who um, lives in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so he'd be interested in this. And uh, an ex girlfriend in Brussels wants to go to France at some stage. Could be interested in your experiences in your region. Certainly, the region is, is fantastic. It's, it's just beautiful, it's peaceful. It's very different from other regions, um, and um, I'm not the only lady alone down there. I've met this fantastic lady who, like me, was widowed because her husband got Alzheimer's, and she is now 87, and she lives on her own with three hectares of land. She chats up the farm to mow the land on the top of a hill with fantastic views, and she said, well, why move? Yeah. And I've gone from wanting to have, no, needing to have CCTV cameras and burger arms and everything else. She don't even bother to lock the door out there. It, it's honestly so difficult. Have you come across the barter system? Where you, you don't lose money. <laughs> we don't talk about things like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. oh, yes. Yeah. They laugh at me. They say, you arrived, you're very uptight accountant, or very proper. And then you get a little carpenter man. Well, if you want a cat for that, I want cash. What do you do? Because yeah. there's so few people to actually to do anything, you can't even want to hide into nothing. All the big work, obviously, is all being, you know, done. But, I mean, they all laugh about, because French tax law is pretty swinging, 30%. And I have to pay national insurance even though I'm retired. There's no sort of get out of jail in France for tax. And as for a tax return, it's pages long. And you might have one tick in one box, but you have all these pages. Makes our system seem quite simple. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to be in by May. So you've got from January to May. Do you have your own account or do you do it yourself? No, I use um, a lady. Um, in uh, the next village. She is, I think she's German and she speaks five languages fluently, so she has a lot of business. Uh, but I'm also going to approach a specialist tax consultant in Bordeaux because you, you've just got to know what you're doing. From the point of view of um, inheritance, for me it's easy because I have two sons because it's still the sons that take priority. But there are places, there's a place in our lane that stood empty for three years, the old boy died. And we know family come and go, but obviously they can't trace all the family, so they can't sell the house, they can't move on, they can't do anything. And so one of my relations uh, in France had that problem, where she had a son who was um, disabled after a uh, car accident mm. in, in the 30s. Um, and it was homeless, sleeping under bridges in Paris or something. Yeah. Or something. And, uh, uh, Late husband had a relation who was uh, always in a, in a wheelchair. So when she died, she left everything to her son and to the chap in the wheelchair. Mm. But they could never find the um, son no. uh, who was in a when went, went through um, various authorities. Mm. Um, and uh, I think for over, well over a decade. I can believe it, yeah. Uh, I mean, she died in 74. Um, in the early 90s, I went to see the property, mm. and it still was um, as before. Yeah. There's no one else living there. And they just begin to rot away. And, yes. 
literally this place down the road, which would be a lovely house, is literally going to rot away because they can't trust family. There's a chateau up on the hill, chateau being castle, massive place. Apparently there's swimming pools and Olympic sized pool up there. Parents have died and there's about seven kids and they can't afford to sell it because of tax reasons. Mm -hmm. So the seven kids have decided to all club together to try and keep it going, but it becomes a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. So my two are going to get lumped with that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> they can have a house each. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right, so uh, yes. can I close down then? Yeah. Thank you for those that have been on Zoom. So it was a test test meeting, so we'll do it again for John Wyman's talk and you never know, something else we'll find out. Huh? Oh John Perry, but that's the other way around. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thank you. Good night, everyone. Cheers. Yeah. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.